Isn't it grand to be a Christian? Yes. In spite of the showers of the day, this is still a lovely place to be because we're with the Lord's people on the Lord's day. And anytime it rains, it reminds us of how God just showers blessing after blessing after blessing upon us. And so we're in the right place today because we're giving Him the glory and honor that's due Him. This is the Lord's day. This day belongs to Him. And so we need to be with the Lord's people and worshiping our Lord on this morning. This morning, I'm going to be talking about how that seven equals one. Seven equals one. Now, from a mathematical standpoint, or from a mathematician's standpoint, uh, this doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Uh, no matter how many times you try to do it, seven can never equal one. But from God's standpoint, as we're going to discover today, Seven does equal one. And I invite you once again to open your Bibles to the text that Glenn read for us. And I want you to notice what Paul has supplied for us through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. These seven, which he says, equals one. Notice what he says once again in Ephesians chapter 4, beginning at verse 4. He says, there is one body and one spirit. Even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. As you read through both the Old Testament and the New Testament, one of the things that's constantly emphasized is unity. Uh, last Sunday night, uh, Michael mentioned Psalm 133 in verse 1 which simply says how good and how blessed it is for the brethren to dwell together in unity. Jesus, when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane and he was praying uh, the last prayer that he would pray to his Father before he was arrested and taken to the cross, he prayed for a variety of things, but the climax of his prayer was there in John chapter 17 and verse 21 that all of us should be one. I want them to be one as you and I, are, as you and the Father are one. Well, I want all of us to be one. And the reason for that is because they want the world to believe that you sent me. Over in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, or chapter 1 and verse 10, the Apostle Paul reminds the church at Corinth, he says, let there be no divisions among you. We've been studying the book of Philippians or a Sunday morning, Wednesday night Bible class. And one of the main themes of the book of Philippians, a church that Paul loved so very dearly. And his greatest concern was that they would always remain unified. That there would be no divisions among them whatsoever, even when Judaizing teachers came in. So as far as God is concerned and His Son Jesus Christ, and as the Bible is concerned through the teachings therein, Unity is something that was very, very important to God and His Son, Jesus Christ. Here in our text today, in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 4 through 6, the Apostle Paul gives us, if you will, seven foundational stones under which we can become unified. In other words, here is what Paul says, if we have these seven things in common, then we're unified. If we don't have these seven things in common, regardless of how we feel about each other, regardless of what we may call ourselves, regardless of how sincere we may be, if we do not have these seven things in common, then we're not unified as far as God is concerned, as far as His Son is concerned, and as far as the Scriptures are concerned. These are seven foundational truths upon which Christianity is built upon. And if they don't have these seven foundational truths, then we can call it Christianity all we want, but it's still not Christianity. I believe all of us realize that we live in a very divided religious world. There are Christianity, there are different aspects of Christianity. Some of these aspects of Christianity are totally opposed to one another. But as we look at the landscape of the United States in which we live, we understand and appreciate that we are a divided Christianity. 
Now we can maybe speak all for one and one for all and say that we're all united in our common belief of Jesus Christ, but that's not what the text is going to be telling us today. In order to be united, in order to be the Lord's church, in order to be pleasing to God, we have to have all seven of these to be united. If that's not the case, then the whole point that Paul is making in this text, you might as well just throw it out the window because it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. We live in a divided religious world. Paul is saying here in Ephesians 4, verses 4 through 6, here is God's remedy. Here is the answer to Jesus' prayer. Here is the answer to Paul's command, Do not be, let, let there not be any division among you. Here is what the psalmist craved for when he says how good and how blessed it is when there is unity among the brethren. Here is the answer to it all. So I want to, what I want us to do today is we're going to go through this text and we're going to take the things that Paul listed. We're not going to take them in order because... Paul didn't intend for them to be taken in order, and we'll talk more about that at the end of the lesson. Paul's doing an interesting thing here with something that's called uh, consent, uh, consensualism, but we'll talk more about that later. But we're going to take these seven ones, if you will, and show you how that they stack on top of one another. And if one be the case, then the other must be the case. And if that one be the case, then this must be the case. Common sense dictates as you pile these stones on top of each other, as you punch these into the calculator, these seven equal one. So let's look at this text tomorrow and break that, uh, today and break down the different things that we find in the text. But as we look at the text, I want you to understand that in the text, as you look at these seven things, first of all, there is the unity of one sovereignty, one God. This is the logical place to stop, start because this is the logical place where everything begins. God is the creator of this world. God is the sustainer of this world. God is our Father. And we need to understand and appreciate that there is only one God. Matthew chapter 12, or Mark chapter 12 and verse 29 points out the fact that the, pre the preamble to the greatest commandment of all, Jesus said, quoting from the Old Testament, says, Hear, O Israel. The Lord our God is one God. The Israelite people understood that. The Israelite people understood that even though there are people who claim there are many gods in the world, and still people today claim that there's many gods in the world, the Israelite people and every one of us who are Christians today understand and appreciate the fact that there is only one God. Now, this is a logical place to start, not only because this is where it all begins, but also it sets the stage for the rest of the things that Paul says. Because how do you define one? Think about it for a moment. Every time Paul uses the, one, the word one in this text, we can point back to this right here. What does that word one mean there as far as God is concerned? Well, Mark 12, 29 has already told us. There's only one God. There's not more than one God. There's only one God. Now, we appreciate the fact there's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. But we also understand and appreciate the fact they constitute one God. They're just separate personalities of that one God. But my point in this is, as we look through the text, we need to appreciate what the word one means. As sure as there is one God, there's one everything else that we're going to be looking at. There's not different ones. There's just one. And we need to make sure we appreciate that. So this is the logical place to begin. The unity of one sovereignty, one God. He is the final creator. He is the only one. He is the one that rules the world and sustains the world. But notice what we should add to this next. And that is the unity of one authority. There is only one authority, and that is the one Lord. Just by the very nature of the name, we understand and appreciate that the word Lord means authority. It's by Christ's authority that we should do everything as far as our religious and, and, and faith and practice should be. In fact, over in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 17, 
The Apostle Paul reminds us, he says, Whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord. By word and deed, he means the things that you teach, word, the things that you do, that is your practice. In other words, everything you teach in the church, everything you do in the church, you do by the name of the Lord. And by name, we mean the authority of the Lord. Uh, we don't use this phrase very often anymore, but when I was growing up, if a policeman was chasing a bad guy, he would often shout in the movies and whatnot, uh, stop in the name of the law. What does that mean? Well, my name is law, so stop. No, that's not what he means. He means stop because of the authority of the law. And so what we have here is the idea that there is only one authority when it comes to the church. There's only one authority if we're going to be unified. We have to be unified under that one Lord or we need to let Jesus Christ be the final authority. Listen to the verse again. Whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all, not just some things, but do all in the name of Jesus Christ. Is it no wonder Jesus said, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of the Father is the one that's going to enter the kingdom of heaven. And that brings out the point that Jesus Christ is given the authority by the sovereignty of the one God, and it's under the authority of Jesus Christ that we find everything that we need to do as far as faith and practice is concerned. And if we're going to be united, then we need to be united under the one authority of Jesus Christ. Some of the last words that Jesus spoke before he left this earth. In Matthew chapter 28, beginning at verse 18, he says, uh, all authority has been given unto me in heaven and earth. And then he told his disciples that they needed to go teach and baptize all nations into the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. And then after saying that, he says, you need to teach those people whom you baptize whatsoever things I have commanded you. And that verse is important because it shows the extension of the authority of Jesus Christ how that authority spread to the apostles, and that's the reason why we had the admonitions from the apostle Peter, from the apostle James, from, from all the different people that teach us in the, in the New Testament, but it's still under the one authority of Jesus Christ. Understand that all those who claim to be Christians, all those who want to be saved, have to respect the unity of the one sovereignty, the one God, and the unity of one authority, and that is Jesus Christ our Lord. But Paul adds another stone to this building block, if you will. And that is, he adds the unity of one revelation, the one spirit. Now notice how this is starting to build, what Paul is doing here in the text. He starts with the supreme being God. And how that we should bow down before God because there is only one God. And if He is our creator and our sustainer, if He is the author of our salvation, then we need to make sure that we are unified under Him. And God expresses His obedience as far as His authority is concerned through His Son, Jesus Christ. And everyone who is going to be saved, everyone who is going to be unified underneath God is going to be unified through the authority of Jesus Christ. Well, how in the world does Jesus Christ express that authority? He doesn't come down from heaven today and talk to us in some small, still voice or some loud vision and whatnot. We're not going to have a better felt than told experience. We're not going to, to see some kind of dream or vision to get revelation from God. No, the Bible very clearly says, and Jesus tells us and reminds us, that His will and God's reveal, uh, revealed will is going to be through the Holy Spirit or one Spirit. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15 reminds us that all Scripture has been inspired by God and is thoughtful for doctrine, for correction, for reproof, for instruction in righteousness that the man, the man of God may be thoroughly furnished unto every good work. Now that verse tells us two very important things. First of all, all Scripture, this book right here, God's Bible, whether it be the Old Testament or the New Testament, has been inspired by God. Inspired by God through the Holy Spirit. 
And the second point that needs to be made from that text is, Paul is saying everything we need is right here. We've been thoroughly furnished for everything that we need. And therefore, if we're going to find out what God wants us to do through the authority of that one Lord, the only way we're going to find out is through the revelation of the Holy Spirit. 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 21 reminds us that the men of old days, as they spoke the words of God, and I'm paraphrasing here, it wasn't on their own minds, it wasn't something that came out of their own heads, but they were moved by the Holy Spirit to write the things that they wrote. Now once again, make sure you understand the point that Paul's trying to drive home here. He's saying if we're all going to be united, we're going to be united under that one God. We're going to be united under the authority of that one Lord. And if we're going to understand and appreciate the authority of that one Lord, it's going to be by looking at what the Holy Spirit has revealed to us through the Scriptures. In other words, if we want to find out what the will of God is through the authority of Jesus Christ, we've got to go to that book and that book alone. One of the reasons why the religious world is so divided is because, yes, they believe in the Bible, but they don't use that as the final revealed will of God. They don't understand the connection between the authority of Jesus Christ and the revelation of the Holy Spirit. In the religious world today, you've got creeds, you've got manuals, you've got books of prayer, you've got catechisms, you've got all kinds of things that men have written that fit their particular denomination. But the Apostle Paul is trying to get us to understand if we're going to be unified under one God, under one authority, there's only one revelation. And once again, remember what the word one means. As sure as there is one and only God, there's only one revelation. It's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit revealed to men what God wanted us to know, and we have it in its final form today, the Bible. If there were some other revelation, if there were some other book or some other thing that God wanted us to know other than the Scriptures, then this doesn't make any sense at all. There's only one Spirit, the one revelation, the Holy Spirit. But notice how Paul adds to this. Now there's the unity of one doctrine, one faith. But think about how this makes so much sense. Think about how this just builds on one another. If there is only one God, then that's who we're going to follow. He has assigned the authority of Jesus Christ as His final authority. Jesus Christ reveals this final authority through the Holy Spirit, through the Scriptures. And if you add those things together, the result just makes common sense that the result, when you add these three together, the result's only going to be one faith. Because if you're only getting your revelation from one Spirit, and that Spirit's only giving us the authority of that one Lord, and that one Lord has received His authority from that one God, the only result that can possibly take place is one faith. To be anything else doesn't make any sense. How can you say, well, we, there's different faiths, but we're getting it from the one spirit? Well, that, that just doesn't add up. If everybody is just simply going by that one spirit, then the only result is one faith. Is it no wonder then, as you start looking through your New Testament, you discover that the Bible talks about the faith? It doesn't talk about the faiths. It talks about the faith. And the faith, that definite article in front of it, especially in the Greek language, is talking about a specific faith. Evidently, the apostles and Jesus Christ understood and appreciated the fact that there was the faith. There was a definite faith. Back Galatians 1.21 talks about how that we can preach the faith. Uh, Jude verse 3 talks about how that we're supposed to defend the faith. Uh, Peter, uh, Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1 tells us there are some who can depart from the faith. 
So evidently, if there's a faith that we can preach, and there's a faith that we can defend, and there's a faith that we can depart from, evidently, there is the faith. There is only one faith. Now once again, <laughs> you look at the religious world, and people talk about many faiths, that everybody has their own faith. Well, that might be all good in their sincerity and their effort to try to do what they think is right. But if we're going to go by the unifying principles that Paul is laying down here in Ephesians 4, 4 through 6, he says there's just one faith. And once again, what does it mean here when he says one? What does it mean here when he says one? It's got to mean the same thing here. As sure as there is one God... There can only be one faith. Anything else does not fall under this umbrella of one faith. And Paul's want to make sure that we understand that if we're going to be unified, if we're going to be pleasing to God, if we're going to follow the authority of God, of, of God through His Son, Jesus Christ, as revealed through the Holy Spirit and the Scriptures, the only outcome that is possible is one faith. It won't work anywhere else. What the religious world needs to do is go back to the Bible and the Bible alone. And if they'll do that, they'll discover that one faith that's revealed by the Holy Spirit through the Scriptures that believes and obeys the authority of Jesus Christ because He is the Son of God who is our Creator and our Father and Sustainer. But look how Paul adds the next thing. There's only one organization, the unity of one organization, one body. Now once again, at least in my mind, this makes such perfect sense. If we continue with these building blocks, if you will, these stones, and we keep stacking them on top of each other, if there's only one God and the authority is only one Lord and a revelation from one Spirit and that leads to the result of just one faith, the only outcome that could possibly happen if there's only one faith is there going to be just one body. Now folks, does that not make sense? If there's only one faith, what would the result be? There can only be one body. If everybody's believing the same thing, one faith. The only result that common sense dictates is that there can only be one body. Now Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22 and verse 23, reminds us that Jesus Christ is the head of the body, which is His church. Now Paul says there's just one body. And that Jesus Christ is the head of it. And he defines that one body as being the church. Now, once again, using common sense, what happens here? If there's only one body and Jesus Christ is the head of it, and the body that he's the head of is the church, there's only one church. I didn't say that. Paul said that. Well, that's a pretty brazen thing to say, that there's just one church. Well, if one body doesn't mean one body, and if Paul says the body is the church, it can't mean anything else but one church. Now, we look at the religious world today, and we see all kinds of different churches. It's amazing some of the names people can even come up with to give their, name, their church a name and make them kind of stand out from somebody else's name. But most of the names that are given to denominational churches are based on one particular practice that makes them different from every other denomination. But Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10, he says there shouldn't be any divisions among us. Jesus prayed that we all be one as Him and the Father were one. There's no way in the world that we are pleasing to God if we're not one body. There's no way in the world that we can have all kinds of different churches if we're supposed to be one body. If we have one faith that's been revealed by one spirit under the authority of one Lord to be pleasing to God, the end result, common sense tells us that the only way that we're going to be pleasing, the only way that we're going to be unified is in one body. And that one body is dictate, dictated by everything that goes up the line. What does the one faith say? As revealed by the one spirit. 
under the authority of the one Lord to be pleasing to the one God. You see how, even from a mathematical standpoint, as far as progression is concerned, this is the only outcome possible. And anybody who does not follow this formula is not in unity. That's the whole point of what Paul is saying in this text. There's no way you can claim that you're part of the one body if you don't follow the one faith. And there's no way you can claim that you're part of the one faith if you don't use just the one spirit as your revelation. But then he adds something else that's interesting. He says there's the unity of one entrance, one baptism. Now I know... When you start talking about baptism, especially in the religious climate we live in today, there are people who ridicule it. There are people who deny the necessity of it. There are people who claim that you can be a Christian without being baptized. They claim that you can be a part of the Lord's church without being baptized. They claim that you can uh, be a part of the Lord's body without being baptized. But folks, it defies common sense. For Paul to put this in the list of everything else he has put in here and then somebody come along and say, well, you know, we can take that one out. It's not necessary. Once again, look how it's built upon one another. Starts with God through the authority of His Son, Jesus Christ, as revealed through the Spirit. The result is one faith that organizes the one body. And now Paul tells us what is the entrance to that one body. There's one baptism. If you want to be a part of the body, if you want to be unified as being one under the body, then you need to have submitted to that one baptism. It's just that plain and simple. And regardless of what the theologians may tell us, regardless of what some manual may tell us, regardless of what some preacher may tell us, I believe the Apostle Paul, because he was inspired by the Holy Spirit, and he says this one is just as important as the other ones. As sure as there's one God, there is one baptism, and it's a part of, it's the necessity of, of being in the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, as he says in verse 2. The one baptism is important, and we discover as we go through God's Word that this one baptism is only for one type of candidate, candidate and that's the penitent rebelief. Jesus says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Peter, on the day of Pentecost, there in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, told us that we needed to, be, to repent and be baptized for the remission of our sins. A person needs to appoint a proper candidate for this one baptism is, is one who is, has practiced repentance and has faith in Jesus Christ. We also know as we read through the Bible that there's only one mode of baptism and that is immersion. Remember how that Paul reminds us in Romans chapter 6 verses 3 through 4 how that just as Jesus Christ died and was buried and rose again the third day we too copy that particular thing when we're baptized. We die to the old man of sin. We are buried in the watery grave of baptism and then we rise to walk in newness of life. Many of the religious world today practice the idea, the fact that you die to your old man of sins, you begin to walk in your new life, and then a later on date, because of an outward sign of an inward faith, or because you want to become a member of a particular denomination, you are buried. Folks, I've done a lot of funerals in my life, and I've never, ever seen someone who was dead who came back to life, and then after he came back to life, we buried him. The only person I've ever seen buried are, are people who are dead. And that's the whole point of what Paul is saying there. As Jesus died, you died your old man to sin. As Jesus was buried in the tomb, you were buried in the watery grave of baptism. As Jesus rose again the third day, so you rise to walk in newness of life. And we also know and appreciate from Acts chapter 2 that here was the way that the church began or how they became a part of that body and how that they'll reveal this through the Spirit because of the one faith. On the day of Pentecost, when the church was established and Peter preached that first gospel sermon, after telling the people there that these miraculous signs of the Spirit was for the purpose of confirming the fact that what they were saying was the Word of God, the revealed Word of God, 
After he says, I'm telling you that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and you need to believe this. Verse 36 of Acts chapter 2, chapter 2, he said, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made this same Jesus whom ye crucified, both Lord and Christ. And the text says, when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts, and they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter said, you need to repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. Verse 41, the text says, And they that gladly received his word were then added to the church. About 3,000 souls. And you get down to the latter part of chapter 2, and it says, And the Lord added to the church such as should be saved. You see, baptism is the entrance to that one body, the church. And as Acts 22 and verse 16 reminds us, and Ananias told the Apostle Paul, who was then called Saul, a man who was dead in his sins, who was going to be lost, but he saw the resurrected Lord, and the Lord told him to go into the city, and you'll be told what you need to do to be saved. And Ananias the preacher said there in Acts 22 and verse 16, And now why tearest thou arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Once again, let me emphasize the importance of this, not because it's just me that's emphasizing it, but if you take this out, then all of this falls to pieces. If you can remove this one thing here, then none of this makes sense. Because the whole point of the text is that these are ones that all go together for unity. As sure as there is one God, there can only be one baptism, and that baptism is necessary. So we can't just simply take it out as to agree to disagree. It's not the point of taking it out so we have unity, as some would want us to do. The point of it is you need to leave it in so we can have unity. Paul's point is that every single person who is a member of the Lord's church, every single person who is a Christian, has had this one baptism. If you haven't, once again, these aren't my words. These are Paul's words. Then you're not unified. You're not a part of the body. You're not a part of the faith. You haven't obeyed the revealed will of the Spirit under the authority of Jesus Christ and trying to be pleasing to God. Well, let's see what else Paul does with this. How does this continue to cascade? A unity of one goal, one hope. Titus chapter 1 and verse 2 tells us what our one hope is. And that one hope is an eternal home in heaven. Now notice what's happened here. He's building up starting here with God, to finally reach his conclusion about why we want all these things to be one, why we want this to all be unified, it's because of this one hope. We already talked about baptism in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 13. Uh, the Apostle Paul says that we have been baptized in responding to the one spirit into one baptism. And the reason for that is, is because we want to have that one hope. That eternal home. And once again, common sense dictates that it began with God right here. Here was the beginning place, and God is where it all began. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Here we see the beginning of Bible. Here we see the beginning of history. Here we see the beginning of God's plan for man. But you come down here, and you see the final gold of God. The final goal of salvation. The final goal of history. The final goal of mankind. And that is to spend eternity in heaven. But folks, please don't miss the point how these all stack up on top of each other. There's no way you can have a home in heaven if you don't add all these to it. There are people that believe in God and they think they have a home in heaven, but not if you don't believe in the authority of one Lord. There are people who believe they're going to heaven and they believe in Jesus Christ. They may even pay, pay ear, uh, lip service to His authority, but if you're not getting your revelation from the one Spirit, if you're not a part of that one faith, if you're not in that one body, if you've not been baptized for the remission of your sins or have your sins washed away, then you do not have that one hope. That is the whole point of this stack of things that we have here. The reason why Paul wrote this particular text here in Ephesians chapter 4, he was given us seven things 
that we can be united under. And if we're united up under them, we know that we are pleasing to God. We're pleasing to the authority of the Son, Jesus Christ. And it's done by looking at the revealed scriptures which leads us to one faith, one body, and one baptism so we can spend eternity in heaven. Now, if you look at the text, you notice that Paul doesn't list them this way. And there may even be some here today that say, well, what you're saying makes make sense, but that's not the way Paul stacks them on top of each other. Well, you need to understand and appreciate the fact that Paul was a Jew, and they wrote things a little bit differently, and they believed in something that was called um, Hebrew parallelism that would help emphasize the thing that he really wanted to emphasize, and at the same time, make the points that he wanted to make. Uh, there's something that's called concentric circles. And Paul is doing this in the text. And if you'll look very carefully at the text, you'll see why he did it the way that he did. What, he, what I said here is the common sense way of looking at it, building it upon one another. But I want you to notice the way the Apostle Paul did it, um, how we cut to this final one hope. Notice that the large circle outside. You notice that the text begins with the body and it ends with God. There the Apostle Paul is putting us in the circle. As sure as there is one God, there is one body. He wanted to emphasize that, as that point. And those of us who truly want to be under God, then we're going to be in that one body. Here's the circle of God being a part of that body. If you are a part of God's body, you are part of His family. You are the sons of God. You are the children of God. You are joint heirs with Christ, and you have an eternal home in heaven. But as sure as God is one God, there is one body. And you need to be in His realm, you're going to be in the body. But notice the next two words, starting from the one at the top and the one at the bottom. Apostle Paul makes another uh, circle here. He has baptism, or spirit, the next word after body, he has baptism, the next to the last word to God. Because God wants us to be within that body, because God tells us that if we're going to be in the realm of Him, we're going to be in that body, He uses the Spirit to tell us the interest of that particular body, and that's baptism. And then in the next way, as you look at it, as this circle starts closing in, in the realm of this great circle of God in the body, that also is manifested through the Spirit and the interest to that body, there's hope and faith. The next word in the list is hope, and the, the word next to baptism, as you go to the very end of the list, is, is faith. We have a home in heaven because of our faith. Our faith is based upon the fact that the Spirit revealed His will to us to give us this one faith, and we obeyed that one faith and have been baptized so that we can be a part of the body, which is God's plan, His family. But notice what Paul has done. In it. Somebody who was reading this in the first century who still understood how Hebrew parallelism worked, I want you to notice what's at the center of those seven, the way Paul put it. At the center of it all is the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the way Paul put it in the text. Because he's using concentric circles, if you will. But it's all based upon the authority of Jesus Christ to get the end result that all of these things tie together and all of us can have the unity that Jesus prayed for, that Paul demanded, that God wants us to have. There may be some here today who believe that God is our Father, creator of this world, but there is only one God. There may be some here who believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and you want to submit to His authority. But if what Paul has told us this morning is true, then just simply believing in God and believing in His Son is not enough. You need to look at the Scriptures and see what the Scriptures reveal about that one faith. And you need to understand as you look at that one faith how it tells us about that one body. And as you discover that one body in the Bible, you discover what the interest is into that one body, and that is baptism for the remission of your sins. All that is done so that we all can enjoy that one hope but if you left any of those steps out, we would love to talk to you more about it today to fully explain it even further. If you have a need this morning, won't you come as together we stand and sing.